So I began in the 70s when um, um, I was very interested in, in how form comes into being. And so I was looking at all the different ways of, of you know, the, the translation of spirit into matter. And it seemed that of all the ways um, that sound was the most important in, and this existed in all traditions. The idea of in the beginning was the word or each tradition had a, a way of describing the beginning as a resonant affair. So it was a process of continuous resonance, of the duration of resonance and, and, and a beginning sonorous event or a continuous sonorous becoming. And um, so in the, in the Hindu tradition, this is um, the idea of the Om is, is the first sound. And, and in, in the West, the idea of the, in the beginning was the word. And so I was really looking at form and pattern. And I'd been working on um, the uh, spiral as a, as a pattern of becoming, as a pattern of the, the, the introduction of, of form into, uh, into the formless. And I'd, I'd been working for many years on, on this as a way of asking questions of the universe um, that were not, uh, that hadn't been asked. So looking at the relationship between um, one thing and another, uh, how, um, uh, how instead, of, instead of dividing things into, into disciplines, taking questions in one discipline and asking if it asking this question of another discipline and, and seeing how it opened up and informed us in ways that we hadn't even thought of the questions. And so having gone from working with a spiral, and I wrote a book called The Mystic Spiral in 1973, I was working in parallel with, with sound as a way of describing the coming into being. And I looked at the work of Hans Jenny, who showed um, how just by the introduction of sound you could see um, from uh, seamless, formless uh, substances, liquids, pastes of different viscosities, how um, this formlessness gradually um, took on form and took on the form and pattern uh, that we see around us in nature. So this was um, a clear demonstration that, that sound uh, on its own brings form where there is none. And so this introduction of form and pattern was my beginning, really. And, um, and also this idea of um, trying to reintroduce um, um, chant, getting people back into their voices. And at the moment, most people spend their lives in front of television screens, in front of video screens, in front of, in front of television screens, in front of, in front of computer screens. And um, I, I envisage a day when people will email each other saying, do you remember there was a time when, when our mouths opened sound came out of them. So we've gone silent as a community. We've gone silent as the more developed we get, the more developed our societies get, the more silent they become. And so my aim is to, is to try and reverse that. So, um, so I, I started um, working uh, in, 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 in groups, in workshops, and um, one of the things that I tried to do was to reintroduce a form of tuning which was um, in tune. So one of the things that happened in the 17th century was that um, with the introduction of pianos we retuned our music in the West, which means that in, since the 17th century all music in the West has been out of tune. So when we, when we listen to classical music, uh, or indeed any music in the West, uh, we're being entrained out of tune. And um, so, you know, you, you can't be sound in mind and body if you're, if you're out of tune. And so when I was looking for ways to reintroduce the voice, I came across a form of chanting from Central Asia, where you chant on a single note only. But you, you um, within that note, if you penetrate that note, you can open that note, you can open it out, you can crack it open and reveal it's inside, and when you reveal it's inside, what you hear is the, poor, the pure tuning um, from which our tuning has deviated. So what we did in the West was to take the octave and, and make every note in the octave out of tune. So before that, um, with pianos, part, of the part would be out of tune and part would be in tune. So they, they redistributed the out of tuneness so that it's now all out of tune. And um, what it's out of tune with are the harmonics. So what I, one of the things that I 
teach and, and what I introduced in, in the 70s was um, a form of chanting where, where uh, you actually make a sound, just a single sound, but you, um, you, you, you uh, work with the resonance of that sound. So what you hear is more than the sound itself. What you hear are the, the harmonics or the overtones or the, the sonorous structure of the sound itself. And, and the sonorous structure is the very tuning on which all music is based, but it's the real tuning. It's the tuning which um, we have deviated from. And so when you, when you allow people to work with this, then um, what happens is that they discover, you know, that they, they can, that their, their different parts of them become in tune. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, um, you're, you're, you're in tune with the environment, you're in tune with each other. Um, the natural world is all based on this sonorous geometry. And, and when we do it for the first time, we recognize it. Um, and, and the reason we recognize it is because um, to, to, to recognize means to again know. So it's something that we knew, and we knew it because this structure is the structure of our very being. Um, uh, and what we're doing is simply making audible the structure of ourselves in a way that we recognize because we're hearing what we are, we're hearing ourselves, and there's an immediate recognition of that.